Sometimes we have a little bit more fun than we should, I think, but uh, <laughs> let's pray. God, the scriptures tell us that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. The scriptures also tell us that the stone that the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. There is great mystery. In you, there are things we don't understand. But we know this that things that the world says are powerful and are meaningful simply aren't. Because true meaning and true power resides in you. And that power was perfected in weakness, made manifest as a little child come to this earth and crucified on a cross, cursed, hanging on a tree. But in you, this was not the final word, for there was hope and victory and life in you. Your power, we don't understand, but we know this, what the world has rejected, we find hope and mercy truth in. We worship you for you are our cornerstone. You are that which our lives are built and centered upon. We thank you for who you are, for your love, for your mercy. Be with us. This we pray in your name.
there is none like Him. I worship Thee, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give You Righteousness, I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. Come on, sing it to him this morning. Sing this to the Lord. I worship. like you, Lord. We worship you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise. For you are my bride. Finishing up a series in the final week, moving into the Easter holiday and Palm Sunday, uh, talking about perfect grace, imperfect people. As long as there are imperfect people in the world, there is a need for perfect grace. Amen? There's our imperfect people all around. Me, you. As long as there's imperfect people in the world, then there is a need for perfect grace. Our entire Christian faith, I'm going to catch you up real quick here. Our entire Christian faith is founded on grace. Without it, we have, we have no existence. We have no purpose as Christians. Not only do we need the grace of God in our lives, which is the most important, but we need the grace that is shared by one another. We need to receive it. And we had not gotten into this. We've, we've talked about sharing it, but sometimes we are stubborn and don't want to receive grace either. Lord, he's already preaching. He's giving away ice cream a minute ago. Let's go back to that. Jesus did not come to, call, to just offer us a one-time gift of grace. Grace is sowed on us every day, every morning. And in turn, we have to return it to others. The following week, the second week, we were reminded that we are God's chosen children. We are his sons and daughters. From the beginning, God's plan was to offer his holy son as a sacrifice for the sins of you and for me, all of humanity, so that we could be adopted into the family. We are literally children of the king. Just let's let that set in a minute. I know you've heard that maybe all your life. But you're a child of the king, bought by the blood of his son. Then we talked about going through the slumps in life, a more practical application of grace in our lives. We all go through difficult times. We go through slumps. We face down times and hard times. You've heard it said sometimes you just fall on hard times. Sometimes you just fall in a slump. And all of us face them. And regardless of what you do, Regardless of how hard you try, regardless of how many people you ask to pray for you and how many times you come to church, and regardless of all of that, you just can't seem to make contact with the ball. You're going through a slump. And while God may not completely rescue us from the slumps, there may be hardships like the thorn that Paul dealt with that may never go away. He will give you the grace to sustain you. I promise you that. 
he will do it. His grace is more than sufficient and more than enough for each one of us in every situation. And then last week, the story of Jesus and the adulterous woman showed us the importance of extending grace to others. If you have been saved by the grace of God, then you have been commissioned by Him to go and share grace with others. It's your job. It's what you do. You go and share the grace that's been given to you. People should experience grace when they encounter the church. I'm not talking about Gordon Lake. I'm talking about you and me. When they encounter us, they should experience grace. And I'm guilty sometimes of not being one to immediately give it. We all have. We just jump right into judgment and accusations and not deserving it. Of course, that's, what it's, that's the definition of grace. Nobody deserves it. But we have to give it. And if people can't come to the church and get grace, then they're not going to get it anywhere. They need to receive it from us. So today we're concluding our series by taking a look at useful grace. Useful grace, and we're going to be in the book of Philemon, the third chapter. Okay, Randy laughed. He's paying attention. There's only one chapter in Philemon. All right, Randy was paying attention. We're going to be in the first chapter, the only chapter of Philemon. We're going to start at verse 4. We're not going to read it all, but we're going to start down at verse 4. Paul says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. Because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith, the church, Paul says, I pray that your partnership with the church may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. What an encouraging opening, introduction here from Paul. Verse 8, therefore, there's always a therefore, right? They reel you in, you know, just to get you close. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner in chains, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you. Listen, this is our text right here. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent. So that any favor you do would not seem forced. But would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while. Was that you might have him back forever. Listen. Listen to this letter here from Paul. No longer as a slave but better than a slave. As a dear brother, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Verse 17, so if you consider me a partner, a brother in Christ, Paul says, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Just in case, we got a problem. You owe me too. 
I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. May God add his blessing to his word today. We're going to stay right here in the text today. Right here in the text. What a powerful little story here. I did, a, I did a Bible study on this two or three years ago on a Wednesday night. We walked through it. A wonderful letter. As you can see here, the letter was written by Paul to his friend Philemon. It makes it very clear in the text that Philemon is a friend of Paul's. Philemon is a Christian man who is involved in serving the Lord and serving the church. So the, the, the recipient of this letter is a godly Christian man. As a matter of fact, he's not only serving, serving under the leadership of Paul, but he's serving in the church. The Bible even tells us in this text that, that he was hosting a church in his home. They were having church in the home of Philemon. Philemon was a brother to the Apostle Paul, and he served, served under his leadership. And Paul wrote this letter to him, and there, it's not really doctrinal in nature. There, there's not a lot of heavy stuff in here. This is a very personal letter. As a matter of fact, when you read this letter, my first reaction is, why is this in the Bible? Pastor, how can you question the word of God? I'm not questioning the word of God. I'm just, come on, I'm just thinking through it. That's a personal letter that I might would write to my friend Jeff. Why is this in the Bible? And I, I, I imagine that when Paul found out, he's like, what? A personal letter that he wrote to a friend of his ended up in the most published book of all time. In God's holy word. Along with his other letters, the many others he wrote. A, a couple more that he wrote in prison, in fact. I bet Paul was wondering the same thing, how it, how it ended up in there. Nevertheless, we have the letter here, and it's for good reason. You see, this letter is about a guy named Onesimus. Onesimus used to be a slave of Philemon. And we're not going to get into the elephant in the room and talk about slavery today, okay? We're not talking about that. There's enough in the Bible that condemns it. Go look it up. But, but Onesimus is a slave to Philemon. But Onesimus made some bad decisions. Has anybody in the room ever made a bad decision? Two of you. All right. He made some bad decisions. He decided to steal from Philemon. He stole from Philemon and then he took off running. I probably would have to. If you're going to steal, you might as well run with it. He takes off running and goes to Rome. Onesimus goes to Rome and while he's in Rome, he encounters Paul. Paul begins to sow into Onesimus. He begins to minister to him. He takes him in and begins to, to talk to him about Christ and, and salvation and living under grace. So Paul has led Philemon to Christ. And now he has led Philemon's slave who stole from him and fled to Christ. Kind of awkward, right? He's kind of like the friend that's caught in the middle. You know, you maybe you got two mutual friends that don't get along with one another, but you're friends with both of them. Kind of awkward, right? Or maybe you're friends with a couple, and then the couple goes through a divorce, and you feel like you got to pick sides. That's reality. That's kind of where Paul's at right here. He, you know, he's got this buddy Philemon in the faith who's doing great work for the church, who would like to get his hands on Onesimus, no doubt, because he owes him some money and some explanation. And now Paul's over here leading Onesimus to the Lord, befriending him. 
It's an interesting story that plays out. The thing is, Onesimus is no longer the person he used to be. And while Paul would like to keep him, and he says that in his word, he's like, I would love to keep him. I could certainly use him while I'm in chains for the sake of the Lord. He decides to send him back. He knew that Onesimus would be much more valuable to his buddy, his friend in the Lord, Philemon. So Paul writes this letter that we've just read. And he hands it to Onesimus and says, take this back to where you came. Take this to your former master who you stole from and ran away from. And that you're currently hiding from. I don't know if I'm going to do it. I mean, think, put yourself in Onesimus, in, in his shoes right here. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm like, I, I know you, I just met you, Paul, and I appreciate you leading me to the Lord, but you, won't, you think this letter is going to keep me from harm's way. This letter is going to do it. So Paul says to him in the letter to Philemon, he says, listen, I could pull rank. I'm sending this guy back to you, and I could pull rank here as the apostle. As the leader of the church. And I could, I could instruct you to take him back. But I don't want to do it that way. I don't want to push my power around. I don't want to push my authority around. And by the way, you owe me anyway. So I want to give you a chance to volunteer to bring him back. That's exactly what it says. We just read it. I want you to, to just open your arms and bring him back. I want you to invite him back in. In other words, Paul is saying to Philemon, I want you to be able to have an opportunity to extend grace. You see, Paul could have just told Philemon, this is what we're going to do. I'm sending this guy back, put him to work in the church. Give him a role, let him fit. He, he's been redeemed, he's forgiven, he said he was sorry. Put him, put him back to work. But no. No, Paul understood the importance. Because he's still training up Philemon here. He's still working with him as one of his leaders in the church. He knew the importance of him being able to voluntarily extend grace. What we preached on last week. He knew how much that would build him up. And he knew how concrete and strong that would make their relationship. None of us want anything pushed on us, right? I don't, I don't want you, no. I don't want that. That ain't fun. It's a lot easier for me to swallow my pride sometimes and be like, okay, I'm going to allow this. Then for somebody to come to me and be like, hey, you know what you got to do. And if you don't do it, then we're going to force you to. Like an employer or something, you know. Nobody wants that. But Paul understood the importance of Philemon doing this. And then Paul takes it a little further in the text here. And he says, I don't want you to just receive him back as one of your slaves. Huh? Paul says, Philemon, I don't want you just to receive him back as a slave. No, no, no. He's no longer a slave. He's your brother. Are, are y'all seeing what's happening here? I'm summarizing everything I've preached over the last few weeks. He's been adopted into the family of God. He's no longer a slave. I'll pay his debt that's owed to you. Accept him in as a brother, as a brother in Christ. Paul says, I know he was a slave I know he did you wrong, Philemon. I know that you've written him off at this point. I know he was useless to you. But he is no longer a slave. His wrongs have been made right. His debt has been paid. And he has become useful. And I no longer wonder why this letter is in the book of God's holy word. This is exactly the life that we are living out. We are all Onesimuses. 
if that's the right plural. Every one of you are Onesimus. You once were a slave to sin. You once needed someone else to pay a debt that you couldn't afford. You once were a runaway from the one who was taking care of you. You once were broken. You once were empty. You once had nobody and nowhere to go in your spiritual walk. All alone. And yet, Grace came into your life and you were adopted into the family and you were forgiven and your debt was paid and you went from being useless to useful. I'm going to bring this home, okay? As Pastor Philip comes this morning, I'm going to bring this home. This is an easy one today. We're tying it all together. Pastor, you just called me useless. To the church and to God's kingdom, you were. But now that you've been given grace, the gift of grace, you are useful now. You're no longer a slave to sin or or death or the grave or any of those things. The enemy no longer has a grip on your life. If you've been saved by the grace of Almighty God, you've been given a freedom. You've been given an opportunity to be useful The enemy may tell you that you are useless. You may tell yourself that you're useless. Others may tell you that you are useless. But I want you to know something today. Perfect grace has made you useful. Perfect grace has given you a purpose. And like Onesimus, God has sent you to the church to be useful. You see, the story in Philemon here of Paul asking Philemon to take Onesimus back, it's less, as much as I spent time on it, it's less about Paul receiving, or Philemon receiving Onesimus back And more about the church receiving him back. Because see, Onesimus wasn't just going back to Philemon. He was going back to the church. And Paul was saying to Philemon, he is useful for you and the church. By the grace of God, he is now useful to you. And Paul understood that I know that he could be useful to me in my chains and in my imprisonment. Certainly I could use him. Paul said, I dearly, I love him. He's my dearly beloved friend. But the church needs him. Paul understood that the church needed Onesimus more than he did. So he sent him back with purpose. The man who was once in slavery, the one who stole from his master, the one who fled and ran away, the one who was broken and imprisoned, he was useful. I don't care what your past is. I don't care where you've been, what path you've walked. You are useful to the Lord and to the church if he saved you by his grace. Hear that from your pastor today. You're useful. You are needed. You know what Onesimus ended up doing? He ended up becoming a messenger. And he was handed the letter of Colossians. You ever heard of that book? He was handed the letter of Colossians and asked to take it to the church. And he delivered it to the church. And today we can open God's word and we can read Colossians because of a man named Onesimus. Doing his part to serve the church and the Lord. In spite of his brokenness. In spite of all that he had been through. In spite of his faults. In spite of being turned away and possibly even hated by those he 
stole from and fled. In spite of all that, God's grace was sufficient enough in his life for him to be useful. And because of Onesimus, getting over all the things that he had done wrong and realizing, being told by his brother Paul, hey, you can be useful. He accepted the call. And all these years later, we still reap the benefits of the words of God that have been shared because he was the messenger who delivered them to the church. Not just to the church at Colossae, but the church here today. You should be grateful for Onesimus. Because of him, we have letters. We have God's word. His inspired word to speak to us. As you stand today, you're probably like, Pastor, where are you going to land this thing? Let me tell you, right here. You are useful. You are useful. Well, Pastor, I just don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't, you know, I don't know where I can be useful at. I don't know what my part is. We'll find you a place. We'll find you something to do. And you may have you may have to be willing to be a little uncomfortable. This guy had to return with a letter that he hoped was enough (laughs) to keep him from getting killed. You think he didn't take a risk and a chance at being useful for the church? Sometimes you got to just take a risk. I don't care who you are, what your skill level is, how old you are, how young you might be. You are useful and can be useful to this place and to the church as a whole. Linda, I'm going to ask you a question. If you don't want to answer, you just say, Pastor, I'm not comfortable. How old are you? I knew that, but I wanted to get your permission. Linda is 72 years old. My parents are like a year younger than her. I, I know. I know that, oh, that, that age. It, you don't move like you did when you were 42. But she does very well for her age. She's very healthy. She puts hours of work into this church every week. Voluntarily. She don't ask for a thing. She don't ask for recognition. I mean, sometimes she wants to get up on stage and stuff. Y'all know her. She wants to be useful. I had someone text me this week. Said, Pastor, they're not even here. They said, Pastor, I I, I hear we having Palm Sunday Fun Day. How can I help? What can I do? Next Sunday, all of you are getting gift bags. This person is putting these gift bags together and they're paying for it with their own money. Useful. Useful. Not even here. Don't feel comfortable coming right now because of certain health conditions. (laughs) This person said, hey, I can still help. What can I do to be useful? Had someone approach me this week and said, hey, a, a teenager in our church has an idea for a ministry that we can start out of this church. Useful. We got a 14-year-old wanting to serve. We got a 72-year-old serving and everything in between. You're useful. You have something to offer. And Sister Vivian, since you're here, I've talked to Sister Vivian several times on the phone just recently. She says, Pastor, I, I'm tired of being locked up in this house. I feel like I can't do anything, go anywhere. I said, I'm so sorry you feel that way. But here's what she said to me a couple weeks ago. She said, Pastor, I can't work as hard as you do for the church. Didn't you say this? She said, I, I, didn't work, I can't work as hard as you do for the church. 
And she's not expected to. She said, but I certainly will do my part. She said, I've been on the phone the last couple of weeks calling everybody, inviting them to church. Checking in on them, seeing how they're doing. Useful. She's useful. Find something to do. There's plenty to do. People serve every week. I talk about the praise team all the time and how many hours they put into it. I texted Irene Garcia a couple of weeks ago and I said, Irene, you and Ray did all these beautiful, this beautiful landscaping out here. It's getting springtime. And I'm going to get out here and cut this grass down to make it clean up and look, look better, clean it up, make it look better. Is that okay if I do that? Because I didn't want to kill something, you know. I ain't the green thumb around here. You know that two days later they were cut and trimmed and cleaned up and everything and it was done. I didn't even have to touch it. Her and Ray came by and did it. Praise the Lord. Ooh. Yeah, praise the Lord. I'm getting them ice cream from Chick-fil-A. Useful, folks. God has a use for you. I want you to know that. Find your place. Come to me and say, Pastor, I don't know what I can do to help, but I'll, let's find it. And we may have to scratch our heads and figure it out. But there's a place for everybody. Oh, Onesimus was just a messenger. Like, all you want me to do is deliver that? Yep, I just need you to deliver this letter. And look at the impact he's had on the world today. All these years later. What impact are you going to have? You've been given grace. What are you going to do with it? Make it useful. Make it useful. Amen? Amen.